Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 573. Today we're going to take a look at London. Now this is a game that is published or was published by Tree Frog Games, designed of course by Martin Wallace. And unfortunately, Tree Frog is no longer uh, doing business, or very shortly won't be. Uh, so it's sort of tricky to find this game now. I've sort of held off on reviewing it because it's been out of print for a little while, uh, but I do get asked to review it uh, somewhat often. And it's also near the top of my Patreons. Uh, they vote every month to you know, kind of suggest games that I should be reviewing. And this one had been sort of trickling around the middle, and now it's like number two, number three. And my next video that I post after this one will be my 1,000th video on the YouTube channel, which is kind of scary. Uh, but I was feeling kind of sentimental. I said, let me buckle down and finally review this. You can get it for a relatively reasonable price. Definitely less than 100 bucks. I've seen it for like 70 or so on eBay and Board Game Geek, which when you consider the prices of new games that are coming out these days, that's not really that much of a price hike. So you can find it, it's just not in print, but hopefully somebody will print it. So what is London about? Well, it plays two to four players. Uh, thematically, it's about sort of rebuilding London after the Great Fire of 1666. <laughs> and so players will be doing that. And they use a mechanism of card play, sort of like a San Juan Race of the Galaxy kind of thing, where you use other cards to pay to build certain cards. And then you'll kind of build this little display in front of you, and then you will run your city. So you kind of build up all these little artifacts and enchantments <laughs> if you're playing Magic, and then you kind of run them all and you activate their special abilities. Uh, then there's also a board where you You'll build burrows and they'll give you points and extra cards and stuff like that. Uh, so let's jump into how the game works and then I will tell you what I think of it. Okay, here you can see the board. We've got this giant deck of cards here and then some other tokens and things like that. A little bit of money. These black discs and cube are called poverty. So the circles are count as five poverty and the cubes count as one. You're gonna start off with five dollars or five pounds and you're gonna start off with also five poverty. This is sort of like a a type of debt. Now there's also the ability to take loans in the game. As soon as you can't afford something, you just take a loan and you just take one of these and you take that amount of money. So I would take 10 bucks if I needed it. And then you can pay it back for 15. And then once you get more loans, you can kind of make, make change with these. So you have a loan of 40, you must pay 60 uh, to pay those back. And if you don't pay them back, uh, you can pay them back you know, right at the end of the game if you want. Uh, but they are going to be worth negative points. And then we have here some victory point markers, which are not double-sided. So you will keep them hidden during the game as you collect them. And then players will get these tokens here in their player color. And these are gonna be put out on these different areas of the board. And they're gonna be creating these burrows. And by doing so, you'll get some points and some extra cards and stuff like that. But the majority of the game is based off playing these cards. And you can see here, they are somewhat randomly shuffled. They have. You know, you can see your letter C, and then the top of the deck is gonna be letter A. So you take all the A's, shuffle those, take all the B's, shuffle those together, and then the C's and shuffle those. And then players will start with six cards off the top of the deck. So let's take a handful of cards here. And then you're going to start playing. And now there is one of four uh, possible actions that you can do on your turn. But the first thing you do on your turn all the time is you draw a card. Now at the start of the game, you can draw a card off the top of your deck, but as players, uh, play cards and effectively discard cards, they're going to start to fill up this board here. And so when you go to draw cards at any point on your turn, including that card that you draw at the start of your turn, you can also pick from the display here. Now if you zoom in a little bit, you can see sort of the tone of these spots. So if you're playing a two-player game, you'll use these six spots here. Three-player game, you'll add these two. In a four-player game, you'll add those two. So there's a little bit more availability in terms of the cards that you can choose. Now, I will make a quick note. There is a two-player variant. I believe it's called the Ben Luca two-player variant on Board Game Geek. I highly recommend you play the two-player game using that. It's a very, very simple, uh, two sort of simple rules. I'll, I'll let you go look that up, and I'll talk more about that in a review. Uh, but I would definitely recommend going and looking that up. Otherwise, it plays, it plays okay with two, but it plays better with three and four with the base rules. So after you draw your starting card, then you can do one of the four possible things. And the first thing you can do very simply, let's zoom out a bit, is you can take three cards. So I could say, I'll draw one from here. Okay, I kind of like that one. And then I'll take another one. Okay, good, I might need another blue card, so I'll take one off there, I know it's blue. So you can draw three cards and that's your turn. So you've effectively gotten four cards for your turn, one for the start of the turn, and then your action of drawing three cards. Now the other thing you can do is you can buy land up here on the board. 
And you can see here the cost. So this will cost you five pounds. You will draw four cards when you do that. And then at the end of the game, that'll be worth four points. Now, starting the game, you have to put it in one of these starting burrows here. And then from there, you can then build on adjacent to even other players. So let's say blue starts here. They pay eight bucks, get four cards and six points. And then you know, it comes along like, I'm gonna build up here. And then you'll start to sprawl out here. So you want to, uh, get pieces out here. It'll give you some points at the end of the game, give you some cards, but this is also going to kind of reduce the amount of poverty that you generate when you take the run the city action, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it's also very important to get out here because you do, do not want to collect poverty or loans or debt for that matter. Now the last two actions are the meat of the game and the first one is going to be to play cards and you'll play these in front of you and then you'll do what's called the run the city action where you're going to activate the cards you've played in front of you. So let's talk about playing the cards first. So the first thing to notice about the cards are the color. So you've got brown cards, you've got blue cards, you also here have pink cards and these are sort of the frequency uh, that they're in the deck. There's more browns and then there's less blues and there's not very many pink cards. And there are also these gray cards and the gray cards are always these poppers here. These are the poor folks. Um, now these cards you really don't want to have in your hand, but you can make use of these and kind of turn them into and make them useful. But sort of generically, they're not automatically useful. I'll say, so when you want to play a card, you can see a couple things about the card here. You have the cost here in the upper left. So this will cost you two bucks to play it. Now some cards like this uh, Valhalla, excuse me, not Valhalla, Foxhall Gardens doesn't have a cost, but you always have to discard a card of the matching color uh, when you play it. So if I wanted to play this school, for example, I would play that, I would pay two bucks to the bank, and then I might discard this other brown card to the discard pile. Now it is worth noting that as you fill up this discard pile, let's say we're playing a two player game, uh, once this is full, and then you have to go to discard again, you're going to discard the top row here and then shift everything up like that. And then you're going to you know, keep discarding and then these will be out of the game like that. And when you do discard cards, you have to discard up here uh, to the top row if there's spots, but sometimes it gets kind of mixed up depending on how players pull cards. Uh, so that's simply just playing cards out like that. So again, you've got to have a matching card of that color. Uh, to do that. But there's the first card I showed you here, which is the school. And you can see here it says pay $1 to change the color of one of your cards. So let's say you didn't have another pink card in your hand to discard. You could, let's say, pretend you had this popper here, which is normally useless. But if you send them to school and you pay the dollar, then you can pretend that that's pink for that turn and then discard that to pay for something else. So this school is a very nice card to get early on in the game. Now, as you play these, you're gonna say, you can play as many cards as you want when you do that. So let's say I played uh, the school and then I played uh, the pink one and then, you know, maybe I was feeling frisky and I'd play the theater royale there. And so as long as I can pay for it, then I'm okay. And that will be my turn. Now, you can play cards as you go along and sort of cover up cards, maybe they'll, uh, get activated and it'll be turned face down or they become less useful and you can play on top of those cards. But you can't play on top of a card that you just played on that turn. So I couldn't play the Great Monument and then play, you know, the hospital again right on top of it. Now normally you can have a duplicate, so I could have two schools or two Great Fire Monuments if I needed to, but in the variant I mentioned, uh, one of the rules is that you don't have uh, duplicates that's not allowed. So I've done that, and then maybe later on my turn, I want to activate my city. So again, you can draw three cards, you can build a burrow, or you can play cards. The final action you can do is you can activate that display in front of you. So the first thing to know about activating your city is that it's always going to generate poverty. You're going to generate one poverty for each sort of stack that you have. So in this case, I've got three stacks or maybe as many cards, you know, as, as needed underneath these, but I'm right away going to be generating three poverty there. So there's my three poverty. You're also going to generate one poverty for any cards that you have in your hand. So if you've got a fistful of cards in your hand when you go to activate your city, that's not ideal because let's say I had five cards in my hand. I've got three poverty from that and then I would take on another five poverty. Now don't be super afraid of poverty because there are ways that you can actually start to mitigate the gain and then also eventually even lose poverty. Now you're going to reduce the amount of poverty that you gain or even reduce the amount that you have overall based on the number of burrows. So in this case, let's say I was the yellow player, I would reduce that amount of poverty that I just picked up uh, 
minus one for each burrow. So if I had two of these out here, then I would reduce that by two. So you can see how important it is to start to build out there, not only for the points at the end of the game, but also for when you go to activate your city. So just for pretend, we're gonna take away those two poverty because we know we have the two burrows. And then you're gonna look here now at the bottom of the cards here when you activate that. So these do nothing. See these blank little sort of homes here. These, these don't really do anything when you activate it. Now these you might be putting in for this ability here. This is sort of an always on ability where you can change the color, but you've also got your victory points here. So that's worth two and that's worth four. And these victory points are going to be still available once you cover them up. So if I played uh, this waterworks on top, you're still going to get the points for that at the end of the game. You're going to dig through and count up all the points that you got there. Uh, but this guy here is going to do something. Now if you look at, there's sort of three spots to all of these, these tomes here. So this one is telling you, you don't have to pay anything to do this. And then you're going to get two bucks as income, and you're gonna get two victory points from the chits, and then you're gonna to have to flip it over, so it's kind of a one-time use. So once I do that, I run it, and it happens. Now you don't have to actually activate all of the stacks here, but you are gonna generate poverty whether you activate them or not. Now there is a cool card I showed you a minute ago called the hospital here. And this has a special ability that says, you may flip this card instead of one that you activated. So maybe I do this one here, I get two bucks and two points, and then I don't wanna flip it, I'll say, I'm gonna flip that one, and then so now next time I activate my city, I'm gonna do that. And it's worth noting that if you have a card face down, you also have to get poverty. Now this one here is interesting, you don't have to pay anything, and the white cubes here, say that you're gonna reduce the poverty by two. So that's another two that we would uh, reduce in terms of what we gained on this turn. And of course, you're gonna to have to flip it over. Now there are some cards here that you do have to pay something. Uh, this one, there might be money in this slot. There might be some other things. This one here means you have to discard a card and this can be any color. You can see it has the four colors there, brown, pink, blue, and even gray. So that's another reason you can send these poppers to work at the shipyard. And then you can get then six bucks, two points, and then flip it over. And sometimes you'll have black cubes here and that'll add to your additional poverty. Uh, there's, this is the game basically, is setting these up, setting up little combos, trying to manage your poverty, the amount of money that you might gain or points that you gain, thinking about, you know, how, how many sort of columns or stacks do I wanna build because that's the amount of poverty that I'm gonna be generating. Typically, you kinda of wanna keep it in line with, you know, what you've got there on the board because if you've got uh, burrows equal to the number of stacks in front of you, then that's kind of a net zero in terms of the poverty you're going to get. And really this is just, you know, what you need to learn by playing the game. Some of these cards here, you can see that he's got no uh, ability there at the bottom, so there's no reason to ever play him down here, but when you play him, it says discard this card to be able to play any two cards onto your uh, building display. And so there's a lots of different special abilities and things that you have to uh, get. There's like banks where you can like put money on them and get money off of it later. Uh, there's ones there that, let's see, um, like a train station here. So this says take two bucks for each borough you occupy south of the Thames. So, and also you can discard that and uh, reduce your poverty. So, but you can see that kind of river going there. So for each borough down there, then you can, you know, get a bunch of money back uh, when you operate that train station. There are some sort of interactive cards that are, you know, you can give poverty to other players and stuff like that. Uh, there's also these undergrounds here. You can see it costs you seven bucks and a pink card to put it out. You place two underground counters and then you pay another three dollars if you have to cross the Thames. And then you can also activate this and you get four points. So what, how do these underground counters work? Well, if you look on the board here, you can see this underground symbol here. So you have to start your underground there and then you start to build out adjacent. And then if you cross any of these uh, bridges here, you've got to pay three dollars to do that. But then you sort of build these out uh, adjacent. And if it's in your spot, you're trying to make it so that they're in your locations, that's gonna give you an extra uh, two points uh, beyond what the board is already giving you. So it's just a way to get some extra points there uh, on the board and running the, the card itself also generates you some points. So you're gonna play through the game until the last card is pulled out of this deck and then you're going to have to, if you can't pay off any loans, you're going to lose uh, seven, seven points whoops, for each of these that you haven't paid off and then you're going to gather poverty for any cards that are left in your hand. So you, you wanna to try to not have any cards at the end of the game and I should 
should say, when you play the game, sometimes you don't want to draw that one card. Like your hand will be perfect. Okay, I'm ready to play all these cards and have nothing. And then the next turn you're like, oh crap, I have to draw a card because that's what I have to do every turn. And then you run your city and you still have the one poverty you're getting for the one card in your hand. So you can't avoid it. So you almost don't want to draw cards. And then you're going to figure out uh, the poverty. Everybody's going to grab poverty for the cards in their hand. And then you're going to see who has the least poverty. So let's say somebody had two poverty and then me and Billy H had seven. So they, whoever has the least, would discard all of their poverty, and however many they discarded, in this case two, everybody else will discard two. So it's sort of, uh, it's almost like the difference in poverty. So Billy and I are each left with, with five, and Francesca had zero because she had the least. And then you're going to look at this little chart here, and you're going to lose that many points. So in this case, Billy and I each had five, so we're going to lose five points. But if you had, you know, like 10, you'd lose 15 points. Uh, so poverty is very much like a, uh, it's a little bit of a chase or a brinkmanship kind of idea. If Billy's getting a lot of poverty, then eh, maybe it's okay if I get some poverty. And, you know, oh, Francesca's not really getting any poverty, so I have to be careful because, you know, I'm going to be stuck with that poverty at the end of the game. So it's all relative. And then you're going to add up the rest of your positive points. So any of these victory points that you've collected during the game, you're going to get points for. For every three bucks, you're going to get points for those and for points on the board there. And then, of course, the points that are on the different cards that you might have played into your display. Oh, and I realized, I think I just misstated at the end of the game. It doesn't happen right away when the last card is pulled. Uh, if whoever triggers that, that'll be their last turn, and then everybody else gets another turn to sort of finish out, hopefully run their city or something. But that is the game. Okay, so that is a London, and this has remained a favorite of my family and also my game game group. I played it with them and I think most of them like it. It's been a while since I've played it with the game group, but I think most of them that have played it uh, enjoy it. I really enjoy it. Now, the where this kind of sits for me in terms of like, let's talk about like the complexity of the game. Uh, it's kind of like in between San Juan and a race for the galaxy in terms of complexity. There's a little bit more going on than San Juan. Of course, you've got the board and you've got some more interesting, I guess you could say restrictions on what you can play with the different colors of cards and just kind of the whole thing of running your city and you know worrying about the amount of poverty you're going to uh, possibly c collect or not collect. Um, it, there's not as many different cards as Race for the Galaxy um, and you get to dig through a lot more cards a lot easier uh, than in Race for the Galaxy. Um, but I like it because it's, it's almost like one of those pretend heavy games because once you play it you know once or twice I would say you're going to be pretty e into the game and it's pretty easy to get into uh, but there is some definite uh things to worry about and things to chew on. You know, you don't want to take too many loans. You don't want to get too much poverty. You want to really manage that hand of cards. I think I didn't mention there's a hand limit of nine cards. You discard down to nine at the end of your turn if you go over. Uh, but you'll have this just you know, sort of handcuff around your hand of cards, and you, you really are trying to work and set up those different combos and make it so that when you do run your city, it's you're doing something fun. You're doing something fantastic. You, you want that good combo out there. If you're just kind of running along, oh, I got a couple of victory points, but then I generated all this poverty, and now I'm kind of behind the eight ball. I've got the most poverty out of anybody, or I'm not generating enough money to pay off the loans that I had to get to actually put some of the more expensive cards down, or you know, I need some money to actually get out onto the board. So there's that real sort of synergy that you have to uh, work and get humming between the cards that you have and how you're kind of occupying the board because the board comes back and reinforms your display because it's going to reduce the amount of poverty you're going to get. So that whole kind of cycle uh, is not always easy to put together because people are taking cards that you want out of the display and they're taking the spots that you want on the board. Uh, the one thing about the two-player variant, there's kind of like a dummy third player. Uh, and I forget the exact rule because it's been a while since I played it two-player, but you basically put out like a third color. I can't remember what triggers that. So it's just kind of, it's not like you take a turn or anything really onerous where you're managing all the stuff. It's just you can't play the same named cards. You can't do duplicate cards in the two-player variant. And then um, a piece comes out. And then it also discards cards off the out of the display too. Yeah. Okay. So, but I would definitely recommend that. But before I forget it, so if you're going to play a two player, go look up that Ben Luca variant. Um, but yeah, it sits in that nice sort of middle ground where you are playing, which I love, is that hand management multi-use card thing, um, and it has that 
that whole thing of really balancing, you know, what you're doing. You know, are you getting enough points out of it? Are you you know how much poverty do you get out of it? You can kind of risk it. You can kind of go poverty heavy early because then you just you kind of lock yourself into having stuff that's ne going to negate poverty uh, later in the game, and you got to make sure that you balance your card row with the board in terms of the number of burrows versus the number of sort of stacks or slots that you build. Uh, I find it actually pretty thematic once you start playing it because. If you think about it, you're really like rebuilding London, you're rebuilding this vast city, and you're all kind of doing it together, uh, And but you're all trying to kind of come out on top and make the most money, or that's not the victory conditions, victory points, but effectively you're trying to be the richest baron, you know, sort of at the end. And in some senses, I kind of feel like, you know, we're taking advantage of this uh, horrible situation and like, oh, everything's been decimated, and I'm kind of coming through and kind of like picking through the bones and sort of maybe exploiting the workers a little bit. Um, but not necessarily. I mean, it doesn't necessarily give you that vibe. Uh, but since it is competitive, I always feel like that cutthroat edge in the back of my head in terms of the theme. Uh, but so I think it works very, very well because you can start to see uh, sort of the progression of the more powerful cards. Because as you go through the ABC deck, uh, you know, you're able to. Uh, make more money, make more points, you start to develop the underground and the infrastructure on the board, um, but you also, what's going to cost you a lot more, so you better have some cards down to sort of build up and that, get that engine going uh, when you do that. But you know, the whole thing of like covering up your cards too, is like, oh, these are great. You know, I really want to keep this because maybe because not all the cards flip over, and it's like, well, do I want to add another stack? Because that's an, that's another poverty I'm doing every time I run the city, you know, effectively. Uh, so it's 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 really tricky to manage, and so just it really feels like you're kind of managing all the logistics of building a town or rebuilding the city, um, and that's very very interesting. And all of the building effects kind of do you know what they say, you know, like you you when you install. Uh, like the irrigation and the plumbing, and you know, that's going to reduce poverty. That's that's all good for everybody, and that's going to help and kind of keep the morale high because everybody's living in a clean area. And you might have a, um, I don't know, like a shipping district card that's going to generate you money. So it, again, it's it's all kind of balancing those different aspects of like city building of the Sim City kind of idea. Um, so I think it works really well. I do hope they they uh, reprint this or something. I know he seems like Martin Wall seems like he is kind of reinventing or maybe streamlining, um, making the games not, you know, quite as heavy like Via Nebula. I'm thinking of that one. That's sort of like a, a steam, brassy, really light game, but in a fantasy world. Um, I could see this one being applied to just, you know, like a SimCity or something or some kind of thing like that. I think the theme though works very, very well here because you've got sort of the skeletal infrastructure post this great fire and you have all of these tools that are just not in the great shape. Uh, excuse me, greatest of shape right now, uh, and you're kind of rebuilding all that. And you know, you get loans from the bank, and and they're trying to, uh, you know, be helpful, but also they're trying to make their money and stuff like that. So I liked all those kind of different sort of pieces of this this clockwork trying to, you know, add into this theme and this these mechanisms. It, it works really well. I think it's a it's it's not super highly rated on Board Game Geek. I can't remember where it's at. I think it might be in the hundreds. Or something, maybe even the 200s, but I think that might be because it, you can't really find it. So, uh, but I think this is one of those kind of that mid-level classic. You know, a lot of the classics I think of of like the early 2000s and 95. That's your classic Euro games, and this is kind of in that that middle period before we hit the you know the the modern euro thing or something i don't know i'm being who cares <laughs> but that's where it kind of sits for me and uh so i highly recommend it and if you can track it down for a reasonable price which you can still find it for um i would certainly um take a look at it i do like the artwork and everything it's not like a fancy but it it does the job it does the trick and i think all the components are fine except for the money i hate all the tree frog money but it's not paper money and it's easy to handle but yeah, that's London. Uh, definitely take a look at it if you can find it and if you feel like the price is reasonable and definitely play the two-player variant if you want to play this two-player and it does work. I have played the two-player variant and I have played it without the variant and it's fine, but the two-player variant's much better because they just... The game works, you know, mechanically. It, you can run through the motions uh, with the two-player as it is, but with the variant, it adds, you know, that extra layer of tension that you miss by having those extra players. But yeah, definitely take a look at it if you can find it. Thanks.